Good evening. This lecture, Lerfoa Tzalach Ben Miriam, Lerfoa Trut Bat Sara, Lerfoa Michael Ben Yael, and Larissa Lea Bat Frida, and Lerfoa Dvora Elisheva Bat Sara, and Lavdi Lilui Nishmat Rita Mazal Chaya Bat Ksia, and Zeev Ben Surya. Gabriel Ben Osnat, Chaim Ben Aaron Zelig. Aleem Shalom. Baruch Hashem, I'm back after a three weeks trip to Eretz Israel with close to 30 lectures. Baruch Hashem. And as you know, they were shooting rockets in last week that I was there. And just when I was worried, maybe they'll cancel my flight or something. The flight was 1 a.m. At 10 p.m. they announced ceasefire. <laughs> so I was able to drive to the airport. Baruch Hashem. Of course, all these rounds, they just show us that the army, there's nothing the army can do. Can bomb, kill a few of the terrorists. Everyone is happy like they won the lottery or something. You kill six jihad terrorists, 60,000 wait online to take their place. They fight who's going to be the next mass murderer. As, as you kill one terrorist, that hour, 10,000 of them were born. So who are we kidding? There is no solution to the situation with them. No, no, no solution. So now we already understand there's no hope in the government, no hope in the army, no hope in the police, no hope anywhere. There's only one hope, Hashem, that's it. אין לנו על מי לסמוך, אלא על אבינו שבשמיים. אין לנו על מי לסמוך, אלא על אבינו שבשמיים. הקדוש ברוך הוא slowly, slowly make it clear to the world that if they counted on anyone, If they counted on anyone, they should already understand. Benji, bring me Chumash also. Chumash Vaikra. If they counted on anyone, now it's time to understand there is no one to count on. As a matter of fact, if you went to Shul on Shabbat, uh, we read two parashot, Bahar and Bechukotai. Right? Bahar and Bechukotai. And uh, when you have two parashot, one after the other, you have to read one aftara. Which one you read? The second parasha, the last one. Thank you. So, since it relates to what I just said, that we have no one to count on besides Avinu Shabashamayim, let me read to you. Let's start today from the end to the beginning. Let me read to you what the aftara that we read on Shabbat is talking about. First pasuk, first verse, Hashem Uzi Umauzi. Hashem is my strength and give me constant strength. Umenusi is my shelter. Beyom Tzara, in a day of trouble. Right away, we get the point. Who is our shelter? Who is our strength? Only Hashem. No one else. Not the Uzi. <laughs> Not the Uzi. Uzi. I say lo Adam Elohim. Ve'ema lo Elohim. A person can make himself a god, fake god, hoping it can help him. No. So I'm going to inform them this time the strength of my hand, that everyone should know that my name is Hashem. And then he continued to talk about, you know, all the sins and all the things that we did. And then comes the punchline. What is it? Listen to this. Ko amar Hashem. This is what Hashem said. This is the word of Prophet Jeremiah. If you want to see where it is, chapter 16. Verse 19 to 21. You can see it over there. 
And then you have uh, another part, which is chapter, chapter 17, verse 1 to verse 14. Two different parts. And what does it say? Ko amar Hashem. This is what Hashem say. Arur. Curse be the man. Arur a gever. Asher yiftach ba'adam. That should count on the human being. Vesam basar zro'o. Umin Hashem yasur libo. He is counting on flesh, on meat, on worthless hope. And that what makes him, it's hard, remove from Hashem. It's like a tree in a desert that, you know, cannot survive. He doesn't see that good should come. Baruch HaGever, blessed be the man, Asher Iftach Ba'ashem, Le'aya Hashem Iftacho. Blessed be the man that will count in Hashem only, and Le'aya Hashem Iftacho. And Hashem will actually be his confidence. Meaning, in order for Hashem to perform you have to first show confidence in Hashem. That's the meaning of the Pasuk. Baruch HaGever Asher Yiftach Ba'ashem. Blessed be the person that trusts Hashem. And that's when Hashem will be his trust. Meaning, if you don't have trust in Hashem, you trust people, you trust the Democrats, you trust the Republicans, you trust Trump, you trust Dos Santos that maybe he will save us. You trust Bibi and TB and the rest of those fake ones. You only make yourself lose 100%. When Hashem said that you develop expectation from people, he remove himself from the equation. Unfortunately, that's what people don't understand. So counting on people actually take away the remedy. Same thing with doctors. You're allowed to go to a doctor, yes. You're allowed to choose a good doctor, also yes. You have to act according to the laws of nature. What are the odds? Over here there are better odds, you go over there. This statistic is better than the other doctor, so you go with a better statistic. But for a second, for a second, you're not allowed to think that your life is in the hand of this doctor. You have to remember that it's 100% in the end of Hashem, not 99.9%. That's already heresy. If you think Hashem is going to perform 99% and the doctor will be 91%, that's impressive. Some people think it's 50-50. Some people think it's 100-0 to the doctor. The doctor does everything. They are complete apicorsim, kufrim. But some people think, listen, of course Hashem does almost everything, but he leaves something in the hand of the doctor. Meaning if the doctor is good, then I'll get saved. And if he's not good, I won't get saved. That's also heresy. So why do we have to go to a great doctor? Let's go to Pakistan. Dr. Ali, he went to University of Gaza, and now he's in uh, Afghanistan, Kabul. We we'll go to him. He cut organs from Mustafa and transplanted them to Said. While one sleep, he moved one organ from the other. You know how they do it in Mexico, so in Turkey. Some people go to all kinds of plastic surgeries. They put them to sleep, and they steal organs from them. In China, forget about it. It's guaranteed. You go with one kidney, you come with one, if you're lucky. <laughs> that they leave you one. 
So the question is, why do we really need to make an effort? Because Hashem said in His Torah that we have to make an effort. That's it. If He wouldn't say it, then you're right. We don't, wouldn't have to worry about which doctor. Anyone would be good. So, Rabotai, listen to this now. And Hashem said, Baruch HaGever Asher Iftach Ba'ashem, Blessed be the man that will trust Hashem, and Hashem will be his shelter, his confidence. Ve'aya, a person like this, Ve'aya ke'etz shatul al-mayim. By which tree? Tree, it's very important where you plant the tree. If you plant the tree where the water running, the tree will always have water, regardless of rain, regardless of temperature. There's always going to be enough water for the tree to drink. He will grow three times faster, will be solid, will be thick, will be strong, will be fresh and will be healthy. Why? Because they have unlimited source of water. That's what it says, the Prophet. Yuval, the path of the water, that's where he's going to spread his roots. He wouldn't care if the heat comes. His leaves are always fresh, not, not dry leaves. When there's going to be a year, dry year with no rains, he's the only one who doesn't have to worry. All other trees are panicking. Three months, the winter started, now one drop of rain. We're all going to die. The trees are going crazy, very nervous. He doesn't worry. He's happy. Why? <laughs> I'm right by the lake. I always have water. And will always give fruit. What's all this uh, analogy? This is comparing someone that trusts Hashem. That he has only Hashem in his mind. Everything is from Hashem. Everything. Like Rav Chaim Ivolojin say, you always have to have in mind, there's no one but Hashem. When you make bracha, everything happens with the word of Hashem, meaning only his word, no one else. It's very important to have this kind of confidence. Now comes the next line. Ani Hashem, I'm God, choker lev. I can investigate what's in the heart of every person. Bochen klayot. I can review the kidneys. Latet laish, to give a person kedrachav, according to his actions. Kipri ma'alalav. And according to the fruit of his actions. I repeat this verse many times in last year. Meaning you're not only going to get for what you did, you donated a few hundred dollars, you're not only getting one-time reward for giving donation. That's besides the point. Now you're going to get from what's coming out of this donation. Another person, and another person, and another person, and another one, and this one influences his wife, who influences her sister, who influences her kids, who influences the, the, the neighbor. You don't even know about it. It constantly travels for years. In every one of them you get full reward. That's called Kipri Ma'alalav. The fruits of the seed that you put today in the ground, all the fruits that are future to grow, every one of them belongs to you. Same thing in a negative way. So it's clear. Ele keneged, ele bara Hashem. Hashem created the good and the bad equally on both sides, one against the other. Now there is a strange verse. You need to understand what's going on here. I first read it to you, then I will translate. Kore dagar velo yalad ose osher velo bemishpat bachatsi amav yazvenu uvacharito ye naval The prophet is talking about a crook. Someone that is a cheater, liar, deceiver, thief, crook. 
It's all in the same family. Someone like that who makes his money in a non-kosher way, what will be his end? Either he will die young and leave the money, he will separate from the money, meaning he will die. Supposed to live to 85, he will die 55. Or 50. Or the other way around. He would live, but the money will die. Madoff will wipe him out. <coughs> or FBI, or IRS, or a bad investment. Or an ugly divorce. The lawyers of his wife, the sharks, smell blood. <laughs> Within a year, he lost all his wealth. It happens to a lot of wealthy people. So, someone who makes money in a non-kosher way is just a matter of time until he will have to say goodbye to this wealth. Either he will die young or the money would leave him earlier. That the other half of the verse, but the beginning of the verse is not so clear. What does it, who can tell me what does it mean, Kore Dagar Velo Yalad? Kore Dagar Velo Yalad, Ose Osher Velo Bemishpat, someone who makes his wealth not in a just, just, justice way, Bachatzi Amav Yazvenu, in half of his life, would leave the money. Ubacharito, in aval, his end, it's like a, like a flower that dies. You know how when a, flyer, a flower dies, it bends down and gets dry? That's what will happen to this villain that stole from people and cheat and deceived and forged. But anyone understand the first four words? Kore dagar velo yalad? Now comes the beautiful explanation. Kore, it's the name of a bird. Dagar, it's when a bird sits on the eggs until the chicks comes out. Velo yalad means he did not give birth. So that's the meaning of the verse. There is a bird that steals babies from other nests. He does not have his own children. So he flies around, find a, an egg or a chick, steal it, and bring it to his own nest. When the babies are growing, they realize this is not our mother. And they run away. So all the stolen goods that comes to him in an illegal way, eventually all run away. So the prophet is giving an example from this bird in the verse. Just like the kore is do doger, he sits on the eggs, pretend it's his, he has position on the babies, but it's not his. Eventually, lo yalad, what does it mean lo yalad? It's not your child. Eventually, these birds are all running away. It's a beautiful explanation. The same way someone who makes his wealth in an illegal way eventually would lose all of it. Mikveh Israel Hashem. What's the mikveh, the source of all the water of, Hashem, of the nation of Israel? Is God. Everyone who leaves you, God, will dry out sooner or later. כי עזבו מקור מים חיים את השם. They left the source of live water, which is God. רפאני השם וירפא הושיעני ויבשע כי תהילתי אתה. Cure me God and I will be cured. Save me and I will be saved. Because you are my glory. תהילתי. That's the Aftara that we read on Shabbat, meaning anyone who counts on people, on politicians, on presidents, on soldiers, on Israeli Air Force, on the Mossad, 
Every once in a while, they have an unbelievable operation that makes a lot of us so impressed and deceived. That's when we begin to have heresy. If, all, if the army will always lose, would always fail, and they're such useless, who would count on them? But every few years they have some kind of success, like the Six Day War. Then after that came Yom Kippur, a massive failure. And then Milchemet Shlom Galil, another failure. And then all the battles with the Palestinian terrorist mass murderers, it's all failures. There's nothing you can do to them. You're afraid to bring soldiers into Gaza. Why? Because you're a coward. You know they're going to kill a thousand soldiers over there. They have booby traps, they have under tunnels. Impossible to win them. So what do you do? You throw bombs from the top. Everyone can do it. No big deal with the equipment of today. You, have, you sit in a, in a plane, it films the whole area, you zoom on an area, they give you targets in advance. They have traders, the Arabs, that get paid by, the, by Israel. They give the sources. The jihad is in this address, this, and they have like GPS. They, have, they know what floor, they zoom. The missile have a camera in the front. It's like a video camera. With a stick, you zoom the, 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 the cruiser on the window, press the red button, it goes into the building, like playing Xbox. It's really that simple. We don't give it too much credit. What's more difficult is air-air battles, planes against planes. That's when you have to be really clever. You, know, you have to know how to maneuver. You, know, you have to know how to fight. But to, to bomb? Piece of cake. Three months in service, you know how to do it. But sometimes they have sophisticated operations, like the head of the nuclear plan in Iran. A few months ago, the Mossad shut him up, destroyed him. How did they kill him? In an unbelievable operation. He is the most secure person in Iran. Everywhere he goes, you have bodyguards around him, car in the front, car in the back. I mean, the future of these Nazis in Iran is in the hand of this scientist. If he will succeed, they will have nuclear bombs that they can throw at the Jews. If he will fail, they will have to wait another 10 years until they get someone else. So he makes millions, and once a week he goes to his summer house, like, just like here in the mountains. And the Israelis, they have spies in Iran. They have Jews, Iranian Jews, that work for the Mossad. They recruit them. They work for them. And what happened? They follow him, and they see his routine. And they, all, and they see there's always a car in front. The car drives in front. But this guy insists to drive. That was his mistake. He drives. His wife sits next to him, and the bodyguard's in the back seat. And there's a car in front. What do they do? They put a truck with a machine gun covered with wood, with remote control. They left Iran a few hours before he passed. They already know what time he's going to pass, on a Sunday, whatever it was. They sit somewhere in the world with a screen. They have a stick. They see the cars coming, there is a turn. When the security car turns, that's when the second car is open for shot. They shot 13 bullets, five of them right into his body. His wife did not get a scratch. That's how accurate it is. Nobody in the back seat died. They sit on a big screen, they zoom on him when he drives, tak, 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 finished. The Iranian came out, they look, who's shooting? Where is he coming from? And then, they're gonna find the machine gun. No, they won't. After they shot him, boom, the car explodes. So they won't even know who was in the car. They look for bodies. Where are the bodies? What's going on here? They never saw such a clever assassination. 
That gave us maybe a few more years before they will have a bomb, this Ayatollahs. Because I don't have to tell you what's going to happen when they have a bomb. It's going to be a whole different game. Who's going to mess with them? Until now, they do whatever they want. They can care less about America and Europe and Israel, do whatever they want. They spread cancer all over the world, terrorism, murders everywhere, explosion, bombs, rocket, shooting, attacking countries. Imagine if they'll have a bomb, what's going to be? So the future of the world is unclear. We will know in, uh, in weeks or in months or in few years what the plan of Hashem. If you want to count on what the Torah, the Tanakh promise, it doesn't look good. I can tell you already, don't have high expectation because the Torah, the prophets, Zachary, Zachary 14, described how the end of the world would be. And it leaves no doubt that we're talking about a massive nuclear war. That two-thirds of the people in the world will die in 12 minutes, we meaning five billion people. And if you think we are safe, we are completely not safe. <laughs> completely not safe. There's a lot of fakers among us, people that pretend to be religious, but they're very wicked. You have all these heretic speakers, which are mass murderers. It's not an exaggeration. They are mass murderers. They continue to brainwash naive people that God needs us and God is a needy and since he made us, we didn't ask to come to the world. Who told you to make me? Who are you to give me instructions and orders and punish me? You have no right to tell me what to do. That's a declaration of war against God. And there's a lot of stupid people who try to defend this nonsense. They will all be wiped out in a second. There's no question about it because idol worshiping even the shogeg is a horrible sin. Most sins, when you do it accidentally, there is leniency. You didn't mean. It wasn't your intention. But in Avodah Zarah, it's unique. Even unintentional idol worshiping, not to talk about declaration of war against Hashem and against the principles, that's a very serious criminals. So everyone who follow those people, will go down the drain with them. Unfortunately, we warn them and warn them and they make fun. They have what to say. But when the time comes, they're going to get it real hard. And then people would say, oh, how come we didn't see it coming? It will be too late already by then to cry. That's why you have to be extremely, extremely careful, extremely careful who you're listening to. There are too many mass murderers out there on YouTube today. The 16 that are on my list is a serious threat. But there are many others. I just don't, I didn't put them in my list because they are not popular. They don't have that many followers. Sometimes when you put a person in a black list, you actually give him more popularity. Why? Because the world is full of fools. They are curious to see who is that criminal that the rabbi talked about? All of a sudden, from 25 views, he jumped to 30,000 30, views. There is a store that they sell books. My friend, he is a collector of books. He has uh, maybe 30,000 books in his house. Collect. Every week he goes to a bookstore, buy another 10, 12, 14, every week. So... So what happened, the owner of the bookstore told him, he came to buy a book and told him sold out. So what? It just came out two days ago. Oh, you didn't hear? The rabbis put it on a ban. <laughs> he said, so? He said, that's why everyone ran to buy it. Because they know it won't come again. You want to sell a lot of books? Make sure to put heresy there that the big rabbis will put you on a ban and you sell 10 times more. You're laughing, but it's very sad. To show you the, the Yetzirah of the people. Just like Hashem told Adam, all the trees are yours. Enjoy the Garden of Eden. Give you the most beautiful woman that you can ever imagine. Angels will serve you, barbecue for you. You have the life. Just don't touch this tree. What happened a few minutes later? That's what the tree wants to eat from. 
then when Hashem came to him and said, did you eat from the tree I told you not to eat? What did he say? He blamed the woman. The man always blamed the woman. You don't know how it is. But, but, he also answered, I ate and I will eat again. That's what the Midrash is teaching us. You don't read it in a, in a written Torah. But you have to, you know what Midrash means? Secret behind the scenes, I call it. You know secret behind the scenes? Sometimes you watch, you know how they have in the movies, they show you how when they made the movie, all the mistakes they made and what happened and the, and the actor, you know, so you have information that other people don't have because you were standing there and you saw. So you have a different, uh, different uh, view on the film. I give you an example. I'll give you a perfect example. A few years ago, there is one very big rasha that the rabbis in Israel, Avovadi Yosef and other rabbis, put him on a complete ban. Complete man. He used to be very successful. They realized he went completely crooked. Avovadia came out, says Rasha, he does only for himself. I will never forgive anyone who follows him. Not in this world and not in the next world. Finished him up. That's it. This Rasha saw that other rabbis are very successful in Kiruv. So instead of being happy that the children of Hashem becoming religious, he decided to destroy every person who does Kiruv. He goes against him and against him and against him, maybe 20 something people. The best one. And many of them are extremely righteous. Like Rav Zamir Cohen, a perfect human being. Cannot find higher than this. Talmid Chacham, perfect Midot, made tens of thousands of Baalei Tshuva. Has a huge organization who spreads Torah in millions of hours every year. Down to earth. Never raise his voice. Do anything you can, you never get him angry. <laughs> you know these people? Try to make the wall angry. Can you do it? The chance you make him angry is like making the wall angry. Impossible. We have some hot blood. He's lucky, his blood is made from ice. Never lose his temper. Always in full control. You never hear him talking in Shonara. Mamash is a person in control. I wish every one of you to be 20% of him. You're going to have a good seat in the eternal world. I was his main target. This, this perfect tzaddik tried to destroy him. So what did he do? He sent the guy, a very sleazy guy, to make a trap to the tzaddik. He said to him, I got an inheritance. I want to give 20%, Maser. Which is, I got 1.8 million shekel inheritance. I want to give 20%, 450,000 shekel. It's a lot of money. It's like $120,000 to an organization. It's, a, it's oxygen. You know, you can pay bills, you can cover some losses. So he said to him, okay, so go to my organization, Idabut. They collect the donations. No, no, no. <laughs> Listen to this. No, no, no. I don't want to get them involved. I don't want any middlemen. I don't know who gets paid there. They take percentage, manager, the, you know, vice president. I don't want any of those. I want to give it directly to the rabbi. What are you going to tell? He said, okay, so I have yeshiva. You can send it to the yeshiva account if you don't want to go to the organization. So here is the account of the yeshiva. Watch this whole thing. He comes with a candy camera trying to build the case that this perfect tzaddik is a crook. After he finished with him, who did he come to? To me. And I say to him, give the money to my guy, he's the one who brings all the CD from China. He's the one who send them the payment. Here is his number, go and give him. So, no, I don't wanna give him. I don't know what he takes. I said, don't worry, he doesn't touch the money. He's a perfect tzaddik. Everything you give him is gonna send to China. You can see, 
You can talk to him, maybe you send the money directly to China, you. But he's trying to get a scoop here. Whatever he did, after a few days, he realized that the person that sent him is the biggest monster, and he flipped against him. And made 300 videos against him and finished him up. What the rabbis didn't do, he did. He hired him to do the job and he turned against him and exposed all the dirt about him and finished him up. That's it, he's finished. So why am I telling you this story? It's been, I don't know, four years since that case. You think maybe Hashem forgot. Life goes on. A week ago when I was in Israel, one of my assistants in Israel said, you ready? I have a very special video to send you. But I have to be sitting and watch the hand of Hashem. That crook that came to record is a plumber in his everyday work. They have a show in Israel that they plan some kind of a fake job. They, op they, they rip the rubber band or they open a faucet that it's not fully closed, there's a leak. It takes five minutes to fix or five shekel, you know, two dollars, whatever it is, plus the visit, 75 shekel, 100 shekel, that's how much it should be. They put a candy camera and the guy comes into the place and the woman play dumb. I don't know, I have a link from the sink. So one guy came, he's tzaddik. It's like, ma'am, you don't really have a big problem. This, all I have to do is to replace this rubber band. See? Let me get one from the car. He puts it in. Pay me just 75 shekels for the visit. Good. They come out. Nice to meet you. It's a wonderful advertisement. Now everyone see that from the next time that they need a plumber, they'll call this guy because he's not a crook. So first they went to London. Some goyim perfectly straight. There was one guy with long hair. He did not cheat. And he even gave a discount more than what he said on the phone. Le he charged less than what he said. They came out and said, nice to meet you, very honest. You had an opportunity now to do it. Not only you didn't cheat, you he even took less than what you said. He said, how can I cheat? How can I live with myself? The guy. Then another guy came out. The snake is a rabbi compared to him. Right, a crook. So you have one good guy, one bad guy. Then one good Jew, and then one bad crook. Who is the crook? That guy. They call him on a job. $20. He charged the woman 4,500 shekel. He bought a device, pretend he checks the pipe outside, Go in, out, what a show he made, this crook. And the, the entire country is watching him. And they busted him. He came out, hi, we are from the show. You, have, you are a heartless crook. You're about to steal from a seven years old skena, old woman. You're about to take advantage on her, shame on you. And he's with the keeper, biggest chilul Hashem. He said to him, you consider yourself a religious person? You should really check to yourself. So what am I telling you? Exactly what he was trying to do to us, Hashem arranged for him mida keneged mida. What are the odds? What are the odds? The biggest shame, he cannot walk on the street now. Everybody watch that show. And he runs in WhatsApp and Facebook, everywhere. And they see him, what a crook, how he makes up lies and this. So, Abotai, that's what life is all about. You do bad to someone, they will come back to you as a boomerang. Soon or later, Shem has his plan. Sometimes right away, sometimes later on, sometimes in 20 years, sometimes in the next life. You can't get away with that. If people will understand that concept, they will have to be extremely stupid to act anyway and take advantage on others. Because you're not hurting anyone but yourself. What you are now doing to this person, you're actually doing to yourself. It must happen to you.
It must happen to you. You embarrass him in public. Someone will embarrass you in public. Who brought it to you? You, yourself. You stole from him. Someone will steal from you. You stole from yourself. You made yourself lose the money. In reality, that's exactly what happened. In Shabbat, Parashat Bechukotai, you have to be super blind not to see the end of Hashem. Not to see the end of Hashem. As soon as the parasha is talking about the enemies that live among you and spread like cancer and they go higher and you go lower and you live in fear because you don't follow my ways. Every year when it comes to this parasha, rockets, terror attack every day. Why? That's the subject of the weekly parasha. That's the subject. I want to ask you, the Torah begins, in Bechukotai Telechu, if you follow my laws, all the Mefarshim explain, Shetiyu Amelim Batorah. That you will put all your efforts in learning Torah. How do they know it? In Bechukotai Telechu literally means, if you follow my laws. How everybody understand that if you follow my laws in this particular line, it means, that you give your life for the Torah. Very simple. Everywhere else, they already talked about the laws. What's the point of repeating it again? So all the Mefarshim and Chazal explain that you will be willing to put all your strength and all your energy and all your money and all your life into the Torah, learning Torah. If you're going to do it, there is a list of blessing that are going to come. A list of blessing. One after the other. If you're not going to do it, there is a list of curses. Quickly, I'll read to you, not, uh, not everything, I may skip some, I just want to get to the main one. Im bechukotai telechu vet mitzvotai tishmeru, and you keep my commandments, v'asitem otam actually doing it, not just religious in your heart. Rabbi, I'm religious in my heart. I love Hashem. I'm very spiritual man. In reality, you keep Shabbat? No. You put filin? No. Yeah, I put filin in a closet. I brought a few very, very high level of filin from Eretz Israel. It's a privilege to put such pairs. Nobody has such pairs, almost no one. They go all over the world. The highest, 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 highest of highest. Best sofer, best batim, no electric use, no glue, no shortcuts, mekuvanot, 100% handmade. <laughs> if you had to buy something like this in the United States, it would be between five and $10,000 a pair. And you buy it for less than what they sell, the most simple one here in the store. You don't know, I mean, you save 80% on the price almost. But for me, it's a sign who Hashem loves because someone that gets such pair of tefillin, it's so rare. Most people buy tefillin with glue. It's not mechuvan. It's not 100% handmade. There's all kinds of issues. The sofer, the metayeg, Hashem irachem. There's all kinds of issues. You gotta be extremely careful because this is life and death. Sometimes in the entire life of a person is good or bad because of his feeling. Or the mezuzot. The Gemara say, they either build the world or destroy the world, the Sufrim. For instance, I brought now a few Megillot to one Hasid here from uh, Brooklyn. The Sufer that write the, mezuzot, the Megillot you have to see his writing. It's like a print. Mamash like a print in a chumash. Print. And one letter is crooked. Now one erased. Nothing. Everything clean. No, no black stains. Nothing. All mamash like a print. Like a machine did it. And he refused to write filin and mezuzot. He only agreed to write megilot. Why? Who can tell me why? Why? <laughs> Megillah, you don't have the name of Hashem. 
He's afraid to write the name of Hashem. Because he has, yeah, Megillat Esther, in Megillah, you don't have the name of Hashem. He's afraid to write Yud Kevavke. Afraid. Why, I understand, he's such a high tzaddik, so I don't want to take any risk. Convince him over the years, right? right. Fill in so with writing like you. It's, it's an honor to have such thing. Only Megillot I write. Just to show you, some sufferim have extreme irat shamayim, and some, Shem Yatsilenu. Some of them, as you know, the quarter yamaka with shorts, with sandals, riding mezuzah and listening to Rita, singing love songs. What kedusha you're gonna have in your tefillin and mezuzot? If you could, I would suggest to put it in the garbage. And they pay top dollars for it, because it may have a nice riding. People think riding is everything. Riding is very important, the level, the quality of the riding. But there's other things that are even much more important. Who is the person? What kind of holiness he is? Who do you want to write your feelings? Someone that learns 30 years Torah non-stop, 15, 16, 17 hours a day, and write one parashiot a week, the entire week, little by little, he finished. Every day, mikveh, complete watching his eyes, not looking at any woman on the street. All his life is in the Torah. Do you know what blessing you have in your life to put it on your neshama every morning and towards the heart? Or to some macher who stand by the shtibel speaking Lashon Hara until 1 a.m. and then he goes home and writes and he has beautiful writing and you buy it. You gotta be very careful. People don't know. They go to stores and they buy. The owner of the store doesn't know who sold it to him. Ask him what's the name of Sofer, 99% of the time he doesn't know. And if you will know the name, he doesn't know anything about him. Does he go to the mikveh? I don't know. Does he ask Kavanot? He does? No. You know? It's life and death, it's no joke. So the, so the Torah says you should actually do it, not just believe. You practically have to do. Rain will fall in the right timing. Too much rain in the wrong timing can be floods and devastations to the farmers and to the whole country. You know how many floods you had in Israel in the last few years? Insurance, they had to bury thousands of cars under the water. They were all water damaged. Why? There was too much rain in a period of two days. The sewer, the drains could not take the water. Floods everywhere, not to talk about all the vegetables and the wheat, everything got destroyed and the tomatoes. Damage of tens of millions of dollars. If it falls in the right amount and in the right time, there can be a profit of tens of millions of dollars. So the timing is everything. Fruits will grow and vegetables. Wheat, barley, olives. You're going to have plenty of olive oil and other oils and minerals. You will eat and you'll be full. No one will be hungry. You would live in your country with a peace of mind and security. I will bring peace to the land. And you will go to sleep with no fear. And I will dismiss bad animals from the land and no sword will pass through your land. Meaning there's not going to be any terror attack. No wars on your land. You will chase your enemy and they will fall and surrender to you. Five of you will surrender a hundred. Hundred of you will surrender ten thousands of them. That's the ratio. Your enemies will collapse. I will come to you. I will multiply you. I will fertilize you, meaning no women will be barren. You won't need Bone Olam, and you won't need all this holy organization who does a wonderful job to help people to, to have children. 
But to begin with, why we have these scares that so many people cannot have kids? It's right here in front of you. One rabbi decided to, they gave, they gave him money to help the orphans. So he decided to go to every house in town and check the mezuzot. They told him, Rabbi, we gave you money to help the orphans. Why don't you decide not to go and check the mezuzot? What's the connection? Huh? Because he said to them, you know why there are so many orphans? Because of this. The mezuzot. It's written. If we are not going to listen to Hashem, v'charaf Hashem, v'atzart ha-shamayim, v'lo yeh matar, v'adama lo titen tevula, v'avatem me'al arza tova, asher Hashem noten lachem. And right after that, he said, you have to put it on your hand, meaning tefillin, and your head, and write it on the mezuzot of your house. So, in reality, sometimes you think, oh, I have this problem. That's not, that's the symptom. The problem is somewhere else. That problem over there causes you to suffer here. If you treat the symptom, the root will continue to issue problems, symptoms. You only, it's first aid, nothing more than that. So after this list, Rabotai, now comes the negative. And if you're not going to listen to me, and you're not going to practice all these commandments, and if you get tired of my laws, and you will be disgusted from my Torah not to do it. You will annul the covenant. I will do the same thing to you. And now there's a list of curses. I will bring panic to your life. I will bring diseases that will kill you within days. You will plant seeds in the grounds and your enemy will enjoy the, what will grow. I will bring pandemics to you. You would lose to your enemies. Your enemies will rule you. You will run even when no one chase you. Meaning you live in complete panic. Exactly what's happening now every day in Israel. Exactly. And if you still won't surrender to me, I will multiply the, the amount of, uh, of uh, strikes that I would land on you. I will destroy your ego, your pride. I will freeze the sky. Your, your entire energy will go to a waste. Your, your trees will not grow fruits. If you continue to say it's all coincidence, you will still not acknowledge that it's my hand doing all of that. I will add more to your suffering. I will send bad animal, animals after you. And if you continue to say it's coincidence, nature, coincidence, I will, I will also act with you with coincidence. I will bring a sword of revenge, a sword of Brit covenant against you, meaning the Arabs. Who else does Brit? The Ishmael. You're going to shrink. You give up property. I will send diseases to the land, and I will put you in the hands of your enemies. And if you still won't listen to me, I don't even want to read the rest. It becomes mamash shocking. So now, Rabotai, from all the list that what I wrote here, what I read here, all the positive and all the negative, all this, all of that, there's not one word about the next world. Heaven, hell, olam haba, kafakela, what's going on over here? The main reward of keeping the commandments, obviously, is not in this world, the Gemara says. Some Gemara in Kiddushin. Zchar mitzvot ba'ayi al maleka. The reward of the commandments is not in this world. You can get some crumbs from the cake. But the cake is waiting for you for the eternal life. You get some crumbs, you know, a little bit piece, you know, like the bakers, how they taste a little bit here, a little bit there. But the cake is going to the shipping. Ha 
how come there's not one word about the next world? Where does the Torah speak about life of eternity? Where does the Torah speak about the reward that will start when we die? Where does the Torah speak about the resurrection of the dead? Before I ask where, I should ask, does the Torah speak about one of the three topics? Does the Torah speak about endless reward? Does the Torah talk about a reward that will start in a time of death? Does the Torah speak about resurrection of the death? The answer is yes, yes, and yes. Ah, you relax now. The question is where? Where? In few places. Bilam, Bilam, the prophet of the Goim, has a prophecy in the Torah. What does it say? Tamut nafshi mut yesharim. My soul should die a straight, meaning honest, decent death. Yesharim, yeshurun, it's Am Israel, like a Jew. I want to die like a Jew. And my end should be like the end of the Jews. What do you mean? Everybody has the same end, but it goes to the ground and the worms eat it up. What does it mean, my end should be like the end of the Jews? Here you see that the end of the Jews and the end of the Goim, it's two different ends, and obviously it's not talking about the physical end. Because the physical end, every fool knows it's the same end. Right? So that's a verse in the Torah that shows you that the Jews and the Goim do not go to the same place when they die. The Goim, if they're righteous, they go to heaven, which is fantastic. For the, on, the only seven laws they have to keep, believe me, they get a huge reward for it. They're not working for free. If they keep the commandments of the Goim, they go to heaven. There's a lot of Goim that does. They keep. They believe in one God. They don't follow Christianity, which is an idol worshiping religion. They don't murder, they don't steal, they behave uh, modest, they don't worship any idol, they don't eat animals unless they dead first. And they obey the police and the court, meaning they're not anarchists, they follow the law of the land. And in general, every rule that is required by common sense, they also have to follow. Like, behave nice to their parents, not to be aggressive and uh, offensive and insulting and embarrassing people and to dirt, to throw dirt on the streets. Obviously, that's not a decent behaving. So if the guy behave in a decent human, the way a human being should behave, not like animals, and of course, they're not pro-gays and not pro-democrats and they don't vote for Sleepy Joe and his friends, because everyone who votes Democrats is wicked, with no exception to the rule. Doesn't matter how long is his beard and yarmulke, and that his tzitzit is swiping the floor when he walks. Everyone that votes Democrat is Russia, everyone. And everyone tell you otherwise, it's politically correct. Someone who votes for a party that promotes abortions, murdering millions of babies, innocent baby just because their mother is a, some kind of a, I don't want to say what. And people have no morality and now when an accident happened, the solution is to chop the baby to pieces. And they already saw millions of proofs by experts what an abortion is and how they suck the pieces and everything. And they continue to defend it and go full force. There's no more wicked than them. They're nothing better than the Nazis. Nazis kill Jews, and they kill everyone. <laughs> murder, mass murder, and mass murder. That's it. Not only that, they pro-gay marriage. Pro-abomination. Declaring a war against Hashem every second. You, a Jew, voting for these monsters? Now you may say, Republicans is nothing better. They're also corrupted, true. 
They also steal, true. They also, some of them gays, true. But they don't want to turn gay marriage into a law. They actually fight it. Do you know in Florida, this uh, Dos Santos, he made a rule that no teacher is allowed to mention the word gay in a class. And they're not allowed to into any gay activity or to talk about changing the sex, any of the brainwash that the kids here in New York get, it's illegal in Florida. They actually arrested a teacher today. They're going to prosecute her for telling a story about two boys that love each other. Fantastic. Every normal person should have moved there. Who wants to send his kids to public school over here? I'm talking secular. We, Baruch Hashem, don't have this garbage in our yeshivot. But every secular Jew is normal, still normal. Tomorrow morning should run, and, and just for that, to put his kids in a public school of Florida. Because over here is a mass murder to your children. You know what they're going to make them? With the brainwash that they give them, these liberals? So if a guy votes Democrats or is a fan of Bernie Sanders, obviously it's not a righteous guy. His heaven is in jeopardy, even though he's not a murderer or may not be a thief or may not be an idol worshiper or maybe doesn't follow Christianity and doesn't eat animals that are alive like Chinese people do. But he promotes and, I, I, and the ideology that he believes in, it's Sodom and Gomorrah. And that's why God hated the going so much of Sodom and destroyed them all. Why? For having ab abomination, lack of morality, no ethic. That's why he kept wiping them out again and again and again and again. That's why the Jews were wicked were being punished again and again and again, meaning there's no tolerance to this kind of behaving. And it doesn't matter how modern you are. You have to clean it out from your head, all the brainwash of the media. But after all of that, there are still millions of goyim in the world that will go to heaven. They are an anti-Semite, they're good people, they pray to God, they talk to Him, they believe in one God. Fantastic people. How many only Hashem knows? Maybe 10 million, maybe 50 million, maybe 150 million. Who knows? Only Hashem knows. <laughs> no, one, no one here can declare a number. So, with the Jews, this entire thing, now one word about Olam Abba. So where does it talk about Olam Abba? We just spoke. Bilam say, I want to die like the Jews are dying. And I want my end to be their end. So we hear from here that the Jews are going to a complete different place than the non-Jews. Where, how do we know that the next life is eternal, full of pleasure? There is a verse in the Torah. Le'ativ lecha u'levanecha Ad olam, to reward you and your children for eternity. It's a clear verse in the Torah. Ad olam means forever. It will never end. And here we only live 78 years. What does it mean for eternity? Eternity means eternity. It's a verse in the Torah. Okay, so we got that. How do we know the reward will start when we die? Maybe the, re the reward is in this world. There's another verse in Parashat Ekev. I'm strict with you. To test you. To check what's in your heart. Will you keep my commandments or not? And what comes right after that? That I should reward you in your end. I will reward you in your end. Where exactly? When I'll be 90? blind and deaf and cannot even get up from the chair and walk with his wheels? When exactly is the reward? The older you get, the more you suffer. No one got his heaven in this world. Every fool knows it. So even if a person would write the Torah, he would never write such a thing. Because every human being knows when you get old, your life becomes harder. 
But according to the Torah, the good will come when you die, in your end. When exactly is going to be this good? When the worms will eat you up in a grave? Obviously, that's not the intention of the rider. So from here, it's clear that the reward will start in a time of death, obviously not to the body, to the soul. Another place in the end of Parashat Vait Hanan, it says, I am the zealous God. Pay my lovers who keep my commandments for thousand generations. How? We only live one generation. Here, we are here and we die. Thousand generations. And pay my haters cash to their face to get rid of them. I will not delay the reward like I do to the righteous people. To the wicked, I will pay El Panav, Ashalem Lo Lavido. Lo Acher Lashalem Lo. I will not delay his reward. I will pay him to his face to wipe him out. It's a clear verse in the Torah. Meaning the righteous, I'm reserving the reward for them for later on. When? For later when? When they are going to be 80? For when is the reward? Obviously for the next world. Rashi writes over there. Pay the wicked for the good things they did, which is not that many in this life, to get rid of them for the next world. And the righteous reserving the reward for the eternal world. Where do you have a source for resurrection of the dead? In the Torah, it's clearly written that Aaron will sacrifice sacrifices in Bet Hamikdash. Now everybody knows that Aaron died in the desert; he never entered Israel. And in the desert, you don't have Bet Hamikdash. Bet Hamikdash was built only in Israel. In the desert, you had the Mishkan, the portable Mishkan. But there is a verse in the Torah that there will be a day that Aaron will sacrifice in the temple. And you know Hashem doesn't make mistakes, right? Hashem is the one who killed Aaron in the desert. He said, go, go up to the mountain. He actually prepared him for that. Go up to the mountain, that's, uh, that's where you're going to die. So Aaron is climbing the mountain knowing that's the last hour of my life. So life and death is in the hand of Hashem. So Hashem knows he's going to kill Aaron. That is not random, it's precise. And he writes in the Torah that Aaron will sacrifice in Bet HaMikdash. <laughs> and there's other sources, but I think that's enough for now for us to just get the point. So now the question is, why over here all the list of rewards is physical? Listen to the answer of the Rambam. The Rambam, Rabbi Moshe ben Maimon, you know, he lived almost 900 years ago. He said, this is not even a reward, all the list of the things that you, hear, that you have here. It's removing the obstacle that a human being has in his mission of serving Hashem by learning Torah to the maximum ability. What are the enemies of learning Torah? What are the obstacles? What makes a person unable to give his life for the Torah? One, enemies, terrorists, rockets, shooting, war. You have to go to the war. How are you going to learn Torah? It's a life risk. Pikuach nefesh. It takes you away from the learning. Two, no parnasa, no money. You have nine children crying at home. There's nothing to eat. You have to go and work. You bring some bread home. It's a very difficult test. Three, diseases. Pandemic. Remember what happened in the COVID? All the yeshivot in the world closed besides my yeshiva. <laughs> we were still learning. But every yeshiva was closed. Almost every yeshiva in the world. COVID. Shut the doors. The big rabbis in Israel say, if we're going to stop all the Torah in the world, it's a much bigger danger than the COVID. 
Today we know how much they were right. 90% of the exaggerations about COVID was made up by the media. In the first wave, millions of people in the world die for nothing, from starvation. Not really from the virus. No, everyone was afraid to take care of them. They threw them in a hospital and nobody went into the room for a week. Some of them died with a note in their hands. I died from starvation, not from COVID. You see now that people that get COVID, nothing happens to them. Now one died in the whole world in the last few months from COVID. I have a friend who's a doctor in a hospital in Queens. Already a year ago, I asked him, anyone dies? And no one. It's even easier than flu. Didn't it weaken in that one? Yes, it get weaker and weaker, the mutations. But even in the first wave, today we know that it was mostly panic. Yes, it was, it was some people died from the virus. Don't get me wrong, I mean. But many died from starvation. There was no, no excess. Families could not go into the hospital. Nobody could bring food. They don't let anyone in. The nurses were afraid to go in. A person is awake in a room without food and water, he dies. This is what happened. So obviously the list of the blessing that the Torah are actually talking about that I will eliminate your enemies and I will give you rain and you will have enough food and you will have enough parnasa and it will not be pandemic and there will not be sicknesses and women will have children, meaning you don't have to start running to doctors and treatments. All of that is not a reward. That's not the reward of keeping the mitzvot. That's just removing the mines on the way, you have mines under the ground. You're afraid to walk through the path. So I will remove those obstacles. And if you disrespect my Torah, the Torah will not become the main thing in your life. And only nonsense will be important to you, such as sport and politics and vacation and playing golf and playing tennis and going to Mexico, and going to Miami, and buying a boat, and changing your car every year, and that's the main thing in your life. Or the stupid phone that you cannot take your face away from it. That's the case. I will bring you all the suffering that you can imagine. Not only you won't be able to learn Torah, even when you would want to learn Torah, you won't be able to. Arabs, sirens, pandemic, Problem, your wife cannot give birth, you have to run to doctor, you have to run to rabbis, praying, crying, reading Tehillim half a day. Why all of that? You, I reached my hand to shake your hands. And you throw my hand away? Oh, you going to miss this opportunity I just gave you? You gonna cry for years for me to reach my hand again to you. You will regret the moment you're born. And listen, listen to all this list. I was on Shabbat in Yerushalayim in the Waldorf Astoria Hotel, one of the prettiest hotels in the world. Nice. Work of art. Hard to believe how they built such a place. They met. Whoever designed that building was a super genius uh, architect. Baruch Hashem, it's all glad kosher, it's all religious Americans, there's, uh, there's hardly any Israeli there. It's um, almost everyone from England, from America, and from South Africa. So, there is a shul across the street, Lotsk, that's the name of it, Lotsk. I guess it's some city in Europe that named Lotsk, they made a shul across the street. But there were about 150 people, and plus they had a bar mitzvah. People from Florida, wealthy people, maybe, I don't know, 30, 40 of them came. It's very, very expensive. You have to first pay flights for 30 people. That's right there, more than $50,000. Just the flights, if you fly economy. Then renting cars. Then paying for this expensive hotel. Then go to the hotel, the bar mitzvah, do the seuda. Play hundreds of thousands of dollars for bar mitzvah. So they came. A lot of the family came and friends from the community. Plus, you had a lot of Americans that lived in the area. It's Mamila. It's one of the nicest neighborhoods in Yerushalayim. It's all Americans there. 
plus the people, the guests of the hotel, the place was packed. And I gave a speech there. And they gave me aliyah to go to the Torah. The Gabai asked me, Rabbi, the whole aliyot went to the family of the bar mitzvah boy. That's why we normally sell the aliyot. This time we give it out. I want to give you aliyah. But since the, the, this is the family event, the only aliyah I can give you is aliyat chamishi. Would you mind? Why did he ask me that? Because it's all the curses. All the curses. Most people are afraid to go up to the Torah. That's why the Baal Korei lowered his voice. Right? I said, of course I don't mind. Oh, I was hoping you would say that. When I gave the speech, I say to them, people are afraid to be called to the Torah when the Baal Kore, when the reader, he reads the curses of the Torah. But they are not afraid to commit the sins that brings these curses to their life every minute of their life. You see how stupid you we became? And all of them goes like that. <laughs> they are afraid to take the Aliyah. I have to be afraid that they're going to read the curses in the Torah. I have to be afraid that none of the things that brings the curses exist in my life. From that, almost no one is afraid. Then on Friday night, at 12 o'clock midnight, still sitting in the table, there was a group of 26 guys from South Africa, from Johannesburg. You know, the South African, the extra polite people. They came to me, Rabbi, I listened to your lecture, da, 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 da. Oh, would you mind coming to give us a speech? We are a group of 26 people, many of them listen to you anyway. Believe me, you know, it was so hard to give a speech after such a meal, <laughs> after midnight. <laughs> the steam of the food already started to come out of my ears. To get into the mode of giving a lecture, but I say, how can I say no? Tov, I have to force myself. That's what life is all about. You have to force yourself to do what's right, not what's comfortable. That's why the Gemara, mm -hmm. the Gemara said, the Gemara said that two and a half years, Bet Shammai and Bet Hillel were arguing if it's good for the person to be created or not. After two and a half years, they all agreed unanimously that it would be better for the person not to come to the world. Ah, ah, come on. That sounds like a Santa. <laughs> maybe, maybe Santa would write another book based on the words of Chazal. Do you really think for a second that Chazal, the holiest rabbi that ever lived in the history, the, 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 the holiest rabbi in the history of the world, would sit for two and a half years to argue if it would be good for a person to come to the world, and in the end, all agree better that Hashem would not make us. That's the, the biggest heresy. The biggest. Come on. <laughs> we really, you really think that there was the argument about? When you read the words of Gemara or Torah or the prophet, you have to be extremely precise. Precise. Every word can change the meaning of the entire subject. The Chachamim did not argue if it's good for Hashem that He created us or He put us in this world. That wasn't the argument. It was never the argument. What was the argument about? Im noach lo la'adam sheba la'olam. Noach. Noach, it's not good. Good, it's tov. Noach means comfortable. Is it comfortable to be born? The answer is no. Life is full of agony. 
test, difficulties, problems, challenges, sicknesses, and many other. On top of all of that, you have to work very hard to learn Torah to be a Chacham. Because if you're, not, if you're not a Chacham, you're basically worthless, according to the Torah. You're worthless. That's the truth. <laughs> it's very painful to hear it, but that's the truth. The Gemara says, Am Haaretz, Ra'uy Le'ashlichol HaKlavim. An ignorant person does deserve to be eaten by the dogs. That's what you deserve. You don't deserve to breathe. You live over here 70, 80 years and you don't know one page of Gemara, shame on you. It's called Yoshvei Kranot. All they sit with his friends doing nothing. <laughs> sitting in a bar, sitting here, sitting there, playing sheshbesh, playing cards, drinking lechaim, sitting on a boat. No, 40 years, you claim to be religious. You don't know one Mishnah to explain. These people have such Gehenom, you have no idea. Limut Torah can neged kulam. Punishments of Bitul Torah is the worst punishment. More than anything you can imagine. Why? Because in Judaism is a huge crime to be an ignorant. In other religions which they are all fake, there is no crime not to be knowledgeable in Quran. Or there is no crime not to be a priest who knows the New Testament. Why? <laughs> It's all fake anyway, big deal, so you don't know. What's to know? Aval, in a divine religion, you have my book on the shelf of your house accumulating dust and you never open it. You don't sit few hours every day to learn. You don't have chevruta. Oh, what's waiting for you? So what people answer is, ah, I'm not smart, I can't, uh, I can't learn. I can't sit in one place. Beloni, someone will offer you $10,000, you would sit a week. A week! In a chair, even to the bathroom you wouldn't go. If you know, you would jeopardize the 10,000, or 20, or 50, everyone has a price. <laughs> Why you don't move Moshe? Shh, calm down. Every minute I sit, we made a hundred bucks. Moshe, calm. Just give him a needle. Ah, now you sit for a month. That would just <laughs> paralyze you. Why? We're making money. Sit here forever. It's like when I brought this guy to the yeshiva, the rabbi asked me, what did you bring? He doesn't know Hebrew, he can't read, he doesn't understand anything. What am I going to do with him? He said, rabbi, every day, every day he sits here, millions of sins are prevented. Just keep him here forever. <laughs> you know how many scenes would be when he goes to the club and play the music to all the Jews and the Goim and the drug addicts and who knows what can happen from this club. Keep him over here. Let him retail him a little bit in English. Ma, what do you care? So anyway, Rabotai, if you don't grab my Torah and you sh don't show me that you are crazy in love with my Torah, I'm going to make it impossible for you to learn. Very hard for you to learn. Why? Because you show me that the Torah means nothing to you. I tell you that the Torah is the most precious thing for me. I tell you that the Torah is the drug of life. I tell you that the reward for the Torah is the highest and endless and will bring you to the greatest place in the next world. I tell you that when you learn Torah, you give existence to the whole world, security to the nation of Israel, blessing to your life and to your family's life. And all of these promises, you take it and put it in the toilet. And you sit and eat like a dog. Every day, that's all you care about. Ah, now you understand why all these curses are coming? Because there are a lot of curses in life. If you're willing to learn, I will move them away from you. If you don't want a cancer, problem, autistic child, 
problem in a marriage, court cases, one after the other. Every one of them, the cause is bitul Torah. And I'll prove it to you. The Gemara said, if you see that the Satan is attacking you, paga becha menuval ze, moshcheu lebet hamidrash. The Satan is attacking you, pull him into the yeshiva. What is it like? You have a Russian spy or Iranian. The CIA just caught him. They are on the way to catch him. If they catch him, they will hang him here. Or electric chair is going to get. Or ears of tortures in Guantanamo. Courtesy of Hussein Obama. But he has only one way to get safe. If he makes it into the embassy before the Americans grab him, no one can touch him. That's a different country. It's here in Manhattan. He can say to the CIA from the window, Como estas, senores? I love you. <laughs> Come down on my dead body. <laughs> you spy, so what? <laughs> Nothing you can do. One step before he made it, Grab him, pull him out. He didn't make it. That's what happened to Jonathan Pollard, the poor guy. He gave his life to the Israelis, gave them the secrets on the, about Iran that the Americans were collecting. Some of that they did not share with Israel as they promised. Pollard, as a loyal Jew, thought that it's good for the safety of the Jewish state. And he started to tell Israel what's really happening in Iran. He never had any intention to hurt the United States. He didn't give information to an Arab country, or to Pakistan, or to Iran. He gave it to Israel. Israel and America is one state. When the Americans were chasing him, he arrived to the Israeli embassy. They didn't let him in. If they let him in, they couldn't touch him. Third is something else, he's sent in jail. What's the, the good part of it? He went secular to the jail, and someone brought him my CDs, and he became religious. And Simantov once met him in Manhattan, huh? with his wife that passed, I love Shalom. And he told him about the story. How do I know about the story? Because I was in Toronto, and a woman came to me after the lecture, Rabbi, Rabbi, you should pray for Jonathan. Who's Jonathan? <laughs> pray for Jonathan. I said, who's Jonathan? He said, Jonathan Pollard. Oh, everyone should pray for him, the whole nation. But it was a little bit strange. You made him Bal Tshuva, I should pray for him. I made him Bal Tshuva. Yeah, we gave him your CD. She was his wife's sister. She's the one who told me that he's religious when no one in the world knew about it because there's no pictures uh, from him on, in a jail. And then a week or two later, of Mordechai Eliyahu, Alav Shalom, the chief rabbi of Israel, got permission to visit him in a jail. He had a kippah and a beard. And now he's free, Baruch Hashem. Courtesy of Trump. So the good news is, imagine if he wouldn't be caught, he would live the life of a king in America, makes good money, working for the American government, having the life, and die in Halel Shabbat and lose his share to the world to come. So the 30 years of suffering in jail, which they tortured him a lot, a lot, was it worth it or not? Absolutely worth it. Ask him now. With all the suffering he had. Unfortunately, because of that, he didn't have children. That's a very, very heavy price to pay. But still, ask him. Better to have children and be secular and one kid will be gay and the other one this and the other one that. And in the end, you have no shirt to the world to come. 
or better to go through all the suffering and in the end you become righteous and you go to heaven. What's better? There is no doubt here. We are not asking a question that has two answers, possible answers. There's only one answer. Everything is worth it to become righteous. And if you think it's my opinion, you're wrong. The Gemara says it's better for a person to be a fool 70 years. You know fool? Meaning one of these crazy people who walks in the street with bags and the children run and throw rocks at him and make fun at him and imitate him, make him take off his clothes. You know these kind of people? Unfortunately, in every place you find one of those. They are homeless people. Not 100% in their head. And what happened? Better to be someone like that 70 years. Everyone laughs at you in the street. You live in a park. You sleep on a bench. You freeze in the winter. You choke in the summer from the heat. You have no shower. You walk with all your belongings everywhere you go. You have to carry it. Everyone makes fun at you on the street. 70 years. Then to be one hour wicked. One hour a crook. One hour gay. One hour mechalel Shabbat. One hour not putting tefillin. Etc. Etc. It's Chazal. It's Gemara. So Rabotai, the Rambam explain every Jew his nature is to keep the commandments. To, to inherit his share to the world to come. But the evil inclination is stalling him. The Torah say, you do your best. Search for my Torah, chase my Torah, and put every effort you can. Once I see you do it, I will take care of the rest and begin to move all the obstacles. I'll give peace in the land. I'll give you enough money coming in, support. The goyim will not chase you. You will not go to slavery. There will not be pogroms and holocaust. Parnassa will be blessed. You have enough for everything you need. Your children dress properly, everything good, good, decent food. Everyone happy, they have a place to sleep. You can even have guests, you have some extra rooms. The Ramban, 100 years after the Rambam, Rabbi Moshe ben Nachman, said that the Torah speaks in general to the entire nation, not for the individual. Peace in the land for everyone. No pandemic for everyone. No empires come to torture you for everyone. No slavery to the goyim for everyone. Rain for everyone. Fruits and vegetables for everyone. It's all general blessing or general curses. But the individual reward is all 100% for the next world. I'll give you an example. One big businessman was very famous as being a very honest businessman. He decided he wants to retire. I'm tired of working. He hired two managers. One to run the store and one to be a buyer. To go and buy merchandise and sell merchandise overseas in shows. And he decided that both of them will make the same annual salary. Same annual salary. The second manager was not pleased. He said he is going to be in an air condition all day, sitting in a, in, a, in a store, doesn't have to run airports, being on a, trains, on a road, and I'm going to run and like crazy everywhere, and in the end we're going to make the same salary. It's really not fair, but he didn't say anything. By the end of the year, he called both of them to pay them their annual salary. Each one of them got his salary, and now he said to the second manager who was on the road, please give me a report of how many trips you had this year, where did you go, for how many days, write it all down and submit it to me. Once he gave him a list of all his journeys, 
He said, oh, I see you work very hard on the roads, here, there, there. Okay, I'm doubling your salary. Give him an extra amount. Next year, the second manager was on the road, work even harder. Why? Because in the first year, he thought, all my efforts is for nothing. I'm not getting paid for it. Why should I kill myself? I have to do something for the business, otherwise I get fired. But I should not kill myself. But now, after he got paid a bonus, the next year, he worked very hard. More trips, more meetings, more selling. Second year ended, the owner of the store, of the business, called both of them. This time, he paid them equal. No bonus to the second one. Who can tell me why? Where is the logic here? First year, when he did not commit, he paid him in the end for all the extras. After you pay for the first time, that's an obligation for the next year as well, no? But the next year, he gave them exact same salary. This time he asked him, it doesn't make sense. Last year I had 30 trips. You pay me extra money. This year I had 60 trips. You should have tripled my salary. Why are you giving me the same like him? What was the answer of the owner? Use your head. You're on the way, on the right direction. The answer of the owner was, oh, the answer, he said, last year you didn't know I'm paying you. Therefore, it was so hard mentally. You go on trips, you go on trains, you suffer, you running to shows, you sleep in places, you risk your life going from one city to another, and you did it anyway. I had to pay you, but this year you were thinking I'm making fortune. You were so happy running mentally when you know you get paid, it's very easy. That's why Rabotai, the Alkut Gershoni says, if Hashem would describe to us the reward of every mitzvah in the next world, no one will waste a second in life. You would not waste a second. Nobody would do anything. No one would watch anything. No one would dance anywhere. No one would listen to music. No one would go to work. No one would care about anything besides learning Torah. Because for every minute of Torah, you would see the elevation of your soul in the next world. It would be so easy to learn Torah. Air condition, no air condition, my back hurts, not as an air, my stomach, food, I'm hungry. No one would care. Legends like the Chazonish did it anyway. Because in their mind it was obvious, the reward of learning Torah. That's why the Chazonish was sitting and learning for three days straight without sleeping and without eating. Show me another person. He was so skinny and short. Like this striper. That's how skinny he was. Small. You can lift him with one hand. Three days learning to understand one line in the Gemara. And he hit the table. It has to go. Cannot figure it out. That second he got the answer. Meaning, he showed Hashem, I did the maximum I can. I'm about to faint. Chazonish once say, I don't remember ever being hungry. We, an hour after we finish a huge meal, already thinking about, I'm in the mood for something salty. You eat something salty, I need dessert. Salty, sweet, salty, sweet, salty, sweet, until you have a face of I don't know what. <laughs> Chazonish, since he never thought about food, his mind was occupied only in Torah, and his, his attachment to Hashem was so strong, his body was eliminated. 
they had to feed him. Someone, it was someone's job to come feed him by force. Abba, you have to eat, please. Open your mouth. Why? He can faint and die. You don't eat, you don't eat, you don't eat. As for Shalom, in the end, can something happen. You dehydrate, you know. I told you the story that one time he got up from the chair, made one step and fell on the floor. So, Afrain Greneman, which was one of Gdolei Ador, who only passed a few years ago, was in his house at that time. He walked into the room, he heard something, you know, on the floor. He saw the Chazonish laying on the floor. He picked him up and put him on a bed. I asked him, what happened, Rabbi, you okay? He said, yes, every day I leave myself enough strength to get up from the chair, make one step, and throw myself on the bed. Because I cannot walk two steps. One, and I fall. Today, I miscalculated. When I got up from the chair, I was supposed to make one step. I had no energy left. I fell. So that means he reached the highest level a person can reach. That's it. That's, there's no, Hashem doesn't expect more than that. That's already a hundred. It's a, it's a, the mark is 100%. 100%. I had the merit that my grandmother walked in his house for a few years. Imagine this. My righteous grandmother was walking in a Chazonish house. And after she passed, all her grandsons from my father's side all became Balet Shuvah except one. What he became? A liberal judge. A liberal judge. And what did he do? he changed his name from Sfaradi to Ashkenazi. Because he can never get promoted to the Supreme Court if you have a Sfaradi name. No chance. Your chances are reduced by 99%. You know the interview with this Rasha Merusha Barak, Shem Reshaim Irkav, the, the host asked him, 30 years you were in charge of the Supreme Court, you could not find one Moroccan judge? The Moroccans are very creative people. Many of them are very educated, great designer, great musicians. I mean, very interesting people. A lot of them are big lawyers also. You see in the list of lawyers, a lot of them are Moroccan names. None of those lawyers were qualified to become a judge in the Supreme Court all these years. Thirty Moroccans have hundreds of thousands that came from Morocco. Hundreds of thousands. Tens of thousands went to the university. Thousands became lawyers. Dozens became judges all over Israel. From all these dozens, now one made it to the Supreme Court in 30 years. What did he answer? We really searched. We could not find one. <laughs> doesn't know how to say Shema Israel, the head of the Israeli Supreme Court. Goim knows how to say Shema. He doesn't know. The guy asked him, the Declaration of Independence of Israel say Jewish Democratic State. Which one you affiliated with? The Jewish or the Democratic? He said the Democratic. What about the Jewish? I have no knowledge in Judaism. My knowledge is zero. My knowledge, do you believe in God? No. No. God forbid. God forbid that I believe in God. <laughs> he decides life and death, this clown. You understand? Similar to Bernie Sanders. Imagine Bernie Sanders, the head of the American Supreme Court. Imagine what will happen to this country. Shem will wipe out America in a week with such a Russia in a Supreme Court. But that's it, that, it is what it is. So Rabotai, he say to him, now when you work second year, you already know you're getting paid, it was a piece of cake. That reminds me when I was a kid, my uncle had the best pizza shop on earth. If you ever wanna taste that pizza, you go to Afula, and the center of Afula, it's called Rimini Pizza. 
and then come back to me and ask me, tell me if I exaggerated or not. The best on earth. Where is it? In Afula, in the north. Until today, they're four years in business, and they win every year the awards, every year, automatically. Number one, Rimini, Rimini. My uncle, he got very lucky. He was already wealthy before he had that pizza shop. But his brother opened that pizza shop with another guy, stranger, the friend. The other guy, I remember him as a child, I remember him as a tall guy, he was in karate. He was a master of karate, like Benji, you know? <laughs> and uh, he hit a, someone with a car, an accident. He hit someone, I don't remember if he died or became paralyzed, something serious. And he was afraid that they're gonna now go after him for millions of dollars, you know? Insurance pay X amount. He was afraid they're gonna take away everything. So he had to get rid of his house and quickly to sell his chair in a pizza shop. And who bought it? My uncle. His brother was already half partner. Two brothers took over. We made millions of dollars over there over the years. But when I was a child, I used to go there for the holiday of Sukkot, and I see my uncle with his apron and three Arabs. One of them I remember, his name was Sami. He's standing over there, the three Arabs, and my rich uncle preparing the dough. You know, you know the, the flour, it's white powder everywhere. It's not pleasant to walk. And you have to breathe it also. So I asked my father, Abba, why our uncle work like an Arab worker? They are the workers, but he's the owner. He comes 5 a.m. with the Arabs preparing all the dough that later they make the pens. So my father said, <laughs> my father had a lot of wisdom when he looked at the world. So my father said, you know what's the difference between him and them? Look at their face when they work and look at his face when he walks. Everyone walks in, ah, how are you? Hey, he's happy, talking. Why? The register, ding, down, ding, down, all day, in and out, another hundred, two hundred, three hundred, five hundred, thousand, ten thousand. So he gets wealthier by the minute. When you make so much, every press you put on the, on the door, it's another fifty dollars. Fifty, hundred, hundred and fifty. So all day sings. The three Arabs, no matter how much they work, it's a hundred shekel a day. <laughs> <laughs> they want to die. <laughs> they wanna... That's the difference. That's exactly the same thing when you are religious with emunah, with knowledge that Hashem will pay you for every mitzvah, you rejoice. When you have lack of confidence, lack of emunah, lack of faith, Every mitzvah became heavy, heavy, so heavy like a huge rock. That's why people are sad and depressed and they don't want to wake up in the morning. It's hard for me. Why it's hard? I can't sleep before 2 a.m. But if I give you $10,000 waiting in the morning, at 5 a.m. you'll be in a shul. Who are you fooling? It's hard. Kasheli! You don't believe about the reward that you're going to get. Kajeli. Kajeli. Abotai, last thing for today and we finish. The Gaon Mivilna, the Gaon Mivilna, the most genius rabbi of 250 years ago in the whole world, and one of the biggest of all time, and the holiest of all time, went to a motel that there was a wedding over there. And one expensive thing disappeared there. And they didn't know who he is. Remember, in the old days, nobody knew who is who. Everyone had beard, covered their head. There's no Google to check. <laughs> so, so the Gaon Vilna, 
they suspected him that he stole it. So they said to him, tell me, did you take that thing, whatever it was, silver thing, a gold thing? He didn't answer. So they started to smack him. Hey, you, answer. They were beating him up. Boom, bam, boom. They threw him out to the street. And everyone started to laugh. I remember that this entire time, they don't know it's the Gaon Vilna. And the Chatan also started to laugh. The, the groom, the groom, it's his wedding. <laughs> what are you happy? Look what they do to this man. So the Gaon Vilna, after they, they beat him up so bad, he said, thank you, Hashem. He gave me the merit to make the Chatan happy. The Sameh Chatan. It's a different way of looking at life. We would say, why did I deserve it? I'm innocent. Why they beat me up? Where is the justice? Thank you for giving me the merit. Le Sameh Chatan Vekalat. Mitzvah Hashuvah. His student, the Gaon Mivilna, is learning from his uh, Rav Chaim Ivolojin, is learning from his rabbi. He went with his wife to a meal of Chatan and Kala. Something disappeared there also. They didn't know who he is. They came to him and said, excuse me, did you see that? No. They started to beat him up. His wife, he told her when they went on the road, she wanted to come. He said, no, I'm not taking you. So she said, no, I'm coming. He said, okay, I will take you only in one condition. That no matter what, you don't tell anyone who I am. I don't want them to know I'm Rav Chaim Ivolojin. I promise. When they were beating him up, say, she said to him, don't dare. Boom, say, no, don't say a word. In the end, you know, my wife see her husband is getting beaten up. Some wife will dance, according to the music. <laughs> but she wasn't dancing, she actually felt the pain. And in the end she said, you're beating up Rav Chaim Ivolojin. Wow, they all got the shock of their life. This is Rav Chaim Ivolojin. They went, they fell on the floor, crying, kissing his feet, asking for forgiveness. He sent his wife back home, so you didn't keep your promise. Adios. Why Rav, uh, the Gaon Mivilna went on a road and Rav Chaim Ivolojin went on a road? This is people who didn't want to stop learning Torah for a minute. On the road, it's hard to learn Torah. The answer is exile. Galus, exile, yeah. it, it's <laughs> repenting your sins. Repentance. Rav Aaron Lev Steineman, Zecher Tzadik Livracha, that passed few years ago, older than a hundred years old. He said today in our generation, the righteous people have no need to go to exile anymore. Why? They can stay where they are. What was the purpose of going to exile? That no one knows you. In your town, everyone knows. The Gaon Mivilna is the king of the town. Rav Chaim Ivolojin, everyone knows. But when he goes to a city far away, 10 miles away, no one knows. There's no communication, no telephone, no internet. Nobody knows how you look. So you come to a place, no one knows who you are. And on purpose, you want them to embarrass you, to kill your ego, to make yourself nothing. That's as a part of the repentance. Working on your character. So Rav, Rav, Rav Steineman say, today you don't need it. Why you don't need it today? Who knows why? Because everyone embarrass you where you are. <laughs> so what if they know who you are? Just look at the comments on YouTube, how many people curse you and make fun at you and call you names. And Baruch Hashem, I have a... A very heavy load. <laughs> it's getting wealthier by the minute. Another curse, another lie, another story. Baruch Hashem. It adds. So that's wonderful. Why it's wonderful? Tell you why it's wonderful. It's also a good question. 
It's wonderful. Why it's wonderful? Because in the beginning, when it's beginning, when the first curse you get, it's like a sharp knife to the heart. Then another curse, and another curse. It's like knives. Tuck, I, 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 like this. One week, two weeks. You get used to the stabbing. Then, at one point, it doesn't bother you so much anymore. Then, you care, can care less about it. Not even a bit. Then you begin to enjoy it. Why? Because in your mind, you already understand that you have a bunch of dogs that bark at you. When dogs bark, you get offended? No, these people are worse than any monsters. So it's like a dog barking at you in the street. The question is, when it hurt in the beginning, first year or two or three, obviously it's a wonderful way to erase your suffering and your sins. But once you get used to it and begin to enjoy the show, is it still a productive tool to erase your sin or no, not anymore? The guy? So according to you, that's it. You don't make the reward. I disagree. Not because, <laughs> not because it's me <laughs> trying to be objective. The reason is, is because if someone, it took him X amount of years to raise, raise himself to a great level of confidence. Once he has confidence in Hashem, he's no longer worry. Therefore, he doesn't suffer from anything. Whatever happened, he knows it's for good. Thank you, Hashem. Thank you, I'm happy. Thank you. Th lost money, wow, thank you so much. Whatever happened, it's only for my own good. I don't have one minute of fear. The question is, does it count as suffering or no? You just lost a thousand dollars on the street, fell from your pocket. Thank you, Hashem. Wow, who knows what should have happened to me? I know you saved my life. Thank you, thank you. I'm happy. Thank you. It's only a thousand. I'm so lucky. I redeemed my life for a thousand bucks. How can I not be happy? The question is, since you ro raised yourself to such a level, these thousand dollars that you lost, that doesn't even bother you. Is it still a punishment or no? It took tremendous work to get to a level like that. Ah, so you get a reward for the work that got you to that level. And you continue to get the reward forever. Where does it say it? I just read it to you today. Uh -huh. In the beginning of the lecture, I uh, God pay the people like to the f right. like the fruits right. of their actions, not their action, the fruits of their action. Meaning, you work very hard. What's the fruit? That you no longer worry and suffer. You're happy from everything. You get a reward, just like in the beginning, but. But, but, it's similar to a doctor. You go to a doctor, and the doctor look at your hands, put ice and keep the arm all night up like this on a pillow, everything will be fine by tomorrow. You get a bill, $1,400. You call the doctor, you want to kill him, what a crook. One minute he saw me on the hallway, 1400 bucks. Excuse me, Dr. X, what is this 1400 bucks? I examine your hand. What? It was on the way out in the parking. You're not paying me for the one minute I examine your hand. It took me 10 years in, in the medical school and this to get to that level that I can look at your hand and tell you right or wrong. You know how many student loans I have? <laughs> how exactly I'm going to pay them back? That's why a one-minute visit by my office, it's 350. An x-ray, another 1,000. A shot, another 500. According to the efforts, who got me to this office? Or a lawyer, same thing. He gives you an advice on the phone, $300. One-minute phone call. I will finish with the story and we'll finish right here.
The Gemara in Masechet Brachot, page 61, tells a story about Rabbi Akiva, the greatest Jew ever lived, who lived 120 years, that was teaching Torah in public. When the Romans, the Roman Empire, made a decree, you are not allowed to teach Torah. You're risking your life, and the people that come to learn by you, they will all get killed. Papus Ben Yehuda. Papus, who was this Papus? A Jew. Even though he doesn't know a name, like you know some Jews, their name is Matthew. I guess it's nothing new. Some of the Jews have all kinds of names. Papus came to Rabbi Akiva, I say, you're not afraid from the kingdom? How are you not afraid to teach Torah? You're risking your life. Rabbi Akiva gave him the famous parable that the fish were swimming and the, and the fishermen tried to catch them with their nets and the fox is, stand, and the fox is standing by the, by, the, by the lake and the fox say, why don't you come up to the, to the land? Me and you, I'll protect you. We'll live together as neighbors. So the fish told him, you the fox that people say that you're smart, you're the dumbest. Here when we can swim and maneuver and we can escape the net, we are worried. You want us to come to the land that we we'll die for sure? So what is Rabbi Akiva telling him? Rabbi Akiva said to him, the existence of the Jewish people is their Torah. Without their, they don't have existence and the whole world doesn't have an existence. So the Romans are trying to make us stop learning Torah, like this we will die for sure. We willing to take our risk teaching Torah and learning Torah, we may live or they may kill us, but at least we go to the life of eternity. You are suggesting that for sure we will stop learning Torah and we should die for sure? At least now I may not get caught. Maybe we will be able to learn. In the end, they caught Rabbi Akiva, they put him in jail, he's waiting for execution. And who did they catch? Papus. Also put him in the same jail cell. And Papus said to Rabbi Akiva, Shrecha Rabbi Akiva, Shenit Pasta Al Divrei Torah. Bless you, Rabbi Akiva, that you were caught teaching Torah. Oi li, oi to me, Papus, that I was caught for nonsense. We both going to die. At least you come to heaven with a title. I die for the Torah. And me, Papus, what do I die for? For nonsense. Very interesting story. There's only one problem. How did Papus die? And why? There was a Caesar that his daughter died in the city of Lod. Somebody killed the, the Goya. Now he wants to kill all Jews. If no, if no one come forward and confess to the crime, I'll kill all the Jews. You have 24 hours to tell me who murdered my daughter. Who volunteered to take the blame? Papus and Lulianus. Two tzaddikim. They sacrificed their life to save thousands of people. They going to die on Kiddush Hashem. Volunteerly. So from here, Abotai, we learn a very, very big Kiddush. The Gemara says, Gadol Talmud Torah Yoter Me'atzalat Nefashot. Learning Torah is greater than saving any amount of life. Save a thousand people, five thousand people, a hundred thousand people from death. Learning Torah is greater than everything. Now you understand what we're missing here. So Papus that gave his life to save the life of thousands of Jews say to Rabbi Akiva, you're so lucky. You die for the Torah, teaching Torah and learning Torah. Look what I'm dying for. If Papus had a greater level than Rabbi Akiva, Rabbi Akiva would say to him, why are you crying? You sacrifice your life to save thousands. Your level is greater than mine. But that's not what the Gemara says. 
דה גמר עשה אבסולוט ליז רייט רבי עקיבא די נתפס על דברי תורה אין פפרוס נתפס על דברים בטלים דברים בטלים means the nonsense of nonsense compared to learning תורה it's gurnish nothing compared to other things פפרוס is a holy man compared to many other מצוות, אבל compared to learning and teaching Torah to the public, it doesn't even come near it. No, after you hear such thing, that's the words of Rav Shimshon Pinkus Zatzal. He brings this Gemara and conclude the words of Chazal. Gadol Talmud Torah יותר מהצלת נפשות. So the next time you want to close the Gemara and be an Atzala driver and go on a call to save life, don't do it. Stay and learn Torah. Who should be an Atzala people? People that don't learn Torah. They learn an hour a day, two hours a day, they have plenty of time. They'll be on a call. You learn 14, 15 hours a day, you want to lower an hour or two from your learning to go be an ambulance driver? You're out of your mind. You're giving up a diamond to make a silver coin. Who would do such an investment? Gadol Talmud Torah Yoter Matzalat Nefashot That's reality. Halacha Lemaseh That's the words of the Holy Chazal. Not my chidush. Who am I? Do you understand, Rabotai? Gadol Talmud Torah Yoter Matzalat Nefashot and one thing you forgot, so what happened with the South Africans after midnight at the hotel? Until now they regret the moment they called me. Because <laughs> I had 15 minutes to talk to them, that's it. And since when I have a group of people for 10-15 minutes, I have to land on them full force. There's no time for preparation, you know. So I started to talk about the three things a person needs to be a tzaddik. Keeping the commandments, fixing the midot, and fixing the ideology, the ashkafa. And I started to talk about everything that God loves, you have to love. Everything he hates, you have to hate. And I started to give examples. And I checked their body language. And some of them were liberals. And especially one of them, when he heard me talking about the gays, <laughs> and see his body language. I say, will he or will not? Will or will not? Will, meaning he's gonna attack me or not? The good thing about them that they're not arrogant. They have manners. But believe me, he wanted to choke me, this guy. <laughs> Why? He's an admirer of the gays. From 26 people, I caught two people like this, that their body language signaled to me that they are suffering tremendously, that I speak against abomination. One of them actually did say something. He said, Rabbi, but you, we're not in this level. We have to live in a world, and the world is not ideal like you described. I said, I live in the same world like you. <laughs> I know exactly what's happening. I just want you to know the goal. If you won't know that by the time you love things that Hashem hates, you will never be righteous. If you hate what Hashem loves, you will never be righteous. So open the Torah and read as many times as you need until your mind will adjust 100% to the opinions of the Creator of the world. So everything in the Torah that has a death penalty, you have to hate. You cannot have, you have to have zero tolerance to this kind of people. You cannot love Michalele Shabbat. You cannot love gays. You cannot love crooks. You cannot love traders. You cannot love Democrats and lefty liberals. You cannot love people who perform abortions. There's a list of people that Hashem hates. If he hates them, you must hate them. Because if your father hates it, and they are the enemies of your father, you cannot run and kiss them. If you kiss them, it shows you hate your father. Very simple. That guy at least understood that that's the right way to be. And the other one, 
also. Then the, the people that were with me say, you're not afraid to just attack them like this? <laughs> I say, that's my obligation. In South Africa, someone will ever tell them that? The speakers that you have today in the world, in America, in England, in South Africa, they ever tell the people all the truth in their face? I'm still looking for that one. In America, we had Rav Rav Avigdor Miller, we had the Rebbe Misatmer, and we had Rav Bravda, and we have many other, many others here in America who used to speak the truth. But today, who's left? Who is left today? Everything became politically correct. Oh, don't say it. People may get offended. Don't say this, don't say that. Come on. You want to be a servant of Hashem? You must say the truth the way it's written in the Torah. People may not like it. No, what can I do? When Hashem gave the Torah, He knew that there will be very many Jews who will hate Shabbat. He knew it. He knew there will be many gays. He knew it. He knew there will be so many academic Jews who hate Torah and admire science. He knew it. He knew there will be so many corrupted crooks. He knew. He knew there is 70% assimilation. He knew that as well. And it still wrote their end. What's going to be their end? Let them read. I don't have to be afraid to tell you what's going to be your end. You want to accept it? Be my guest. You want to disagree and you want to make a war over it? It's your problem. My obligation, you want to teach Torah? Teach authentically. You cannot handle the pressure? Don't be a teacher. Quit. You want to be a doctor? Tell the patients exactly what they suffer from and tell them that it's going to be very painful to cure them. Don't give them to Advil and send them home, that they should die a month later. Oh, but I can't tell them they have cancer. So quit. You cannot be a doctor. You can't. You want to be a president? You have to be a strong dictator. There's no other way. If you let everyone climb on your head, you know how it's going to look. You have to be strong. You have to handle the pressure. I was in the Knesset this week on Wednesday. I went to meet the Minister of, of uh, Justice, Yariv Levine, the one who's in charge of all the revolution now. I don't know if you saw my pictures, we posted them on a group. I'm in a Knesset meeting the most important, important person in Israeli politics now, and I'm standing in the hallway with my friend, my student, and my assistant, and who comes in front of me in the hallway? The biggest hater of Torah and rabbis and religious people in Israel. Who? Who hates us the most? That say we have to dump all of us to the Mizbala, to the garbage. Avigdor Lieberman, Shem Reshaim Irkav. The one that in every one of my lectures I said the day he will die we have to make parties. And they interview me on Israeli television on prime time. You say that when, when the Minister of Defense, Avigdor Lieberman, will die, everybody has to make a party. Would you like to take your words back? I said, no, I have nothing to apologize to you. And not to be politically correct is the enemy of God and the enemy of the Jewish people. And David HaMelech wrote in Tehilim, Be'avod Reshaim Rina. When he will die, we will be very happy about it. And I have nothing to apologize to. And he knows it. They ask him, what do you think about what the rabbis say? I do not want to comment on rabbis of hate. That's what he said. Now he walks in a hallway. He lifts his face. Almost dropped dead. He saw me on the hallway, but there's nowhere to run. <laughs> if he will turn and go back, it would look stupid. He has to pass between me and my friend. There's a, there is a narrow entry. I look at him with my eyes. You had to see how his body shrink like this. <laughs> with his bodyguard walks behind him. I know body language. He was dying from shame. A minute after I climb the stairs, who comes? Yair Lapid, his partner. <laughs> but unlike him, he's full of confidence. Shalom. 
he came out of the embarrassment in a different way. But the other one, I was wondering to myself, let's see if he's brave, like he's talking against the religious people all over the media. Let's see if he's going to say something to me. Like a little puppy. He went like this, and that was the end of it. There's so many weeks. They open a yeshiva in Tel Aviv. All they do is now demonstrate to close that yeshiva. Can't stand Torah. They go crazy. The religious people of that yeshiva treated them so nicely. It's giving them food and drinks and invite them and... And what happened, the, more, the nicer they are to them, the more they hate them. Because it's written in the Torah, if you kiss up to the wicked people and give them compliment, Hashem will make you fall in their hands. And if you won't fall to, in their hands, your children will. So, uh, Rabbi, we're trying to you know, make peace with them. It's not so simple. Some people, it's a mitzvah to make peace with them. Some people, you have to eliminate completely from your life. Not even to say hello to them. En shalom la reshaim amar Hashem. No hello, no peace to the, to the wicked, Hashem said. So what are we going to do? We have to focus on Torah and mitzvot. What we have to do about them? Let them bark until the end of days. Continue to bark. Aye, but maybe they can hurt us. After all, they, they have power. If we learn Torah with devotion, if we will be righteous, if we keep the commandments, if we fix our behaving, they cannot touch us even a bit. If they can hurt us, that means we are guilty in the eyes of Hashem. If we are not guilty, now one of them can hurt us. Because it's all in the end of Hashem. And what's the best proof? 1,200 missiles landed on cities in Israel. 1,200. Boom, boom, boom. Every minute an explosion. 90% of the missiles were shut down by the Iron Dome. Some of them fell in the open places and some fell on Palestinian territory and killed nine of them. Arabs kill Arabs. The Jihad killed nine of their own people. Nobody make a beep about it. They killed their own people. Two people die in Israeli property. One woman, Christian Armenian in Rehovot. I was a mile away when the bomb exploded. Me and my assistant Avishai were in a car. Boom! boom. The whole car was shaking. People laying down on the street in the middle of the, on the highway. They stopped the car, the, the sirens. Sirens, very scary. People lay on the, with suits on the sand by the bushes, under the car, getting dirty. I said to him, what are we doing? We have a lecture. As we drive, boom! I said to him, wow, a missile just fell around here. He told me, no, it's probably the missile hit one of them. That's the noise. Ten minutes later on the news, a missile just fell in Rehovot, a mile away from where we were. And a woman just died. We don't know now, a Jew, not Jew. In Israel, in Rehovot. A few days ago, they just announced she was an Armenian Christian. Another missile fell. A father of a two years old baby just died. They don't tell you a Jew and an Arab on the news. Two, three days later, they put the picture, you see another Arab. 1,200 missiles, two Goim died. Now one Jew got hurt. Two missiles fell on Arabs by their territory. Five died, four died. Two, kill nine. 1,200, kill no Jews. Uh, you tell a liberal, ah, coincidence, <laughs> coincidence. <laughs> How will he admit the miracle of Hashem? He eats treif every day, he can see the miracle. 
full of impurity, tuma. We see the miracles of Hashem. 1200, you know what it means? 12, you know, you, did you see what it did to the building? One missile hit the building in Rehovot, they have to knock down the entire building now. It's not only the one apartment that got damaged. They are, the engineers came and said, there's nothing we can do. We have to bring down the whole building. The whole building! One rocket! If all 1,200 would hit each one in a building, it would be the end of us. The Iron Dome. All the Israeli chief of command, expert, were against it. Don't waste money on it. Except one ignorant fool with a mustache, the clown of Israel, Amir Peretz. There was no record in military. He, he wanted to be a minister of defense. Uh, let this fool be anyway, he doesn't know anything. We will decide what to do. We will tell him what we're doing. He wants to be the minister, put him the minister. Since he doesn't know anything about military, we, the generals, will make the decision. So now when they have to sign, if to make the Iron Dome, all of them are against that, except this ignorant. So, no, I think it's important. <laughs> they said to him, no, it's gonna cost billions, it's not worth it. No, no, I want it. No, please don't do that, I want it. <laughs> While he's arguing with them, they gave him a binoculars to look at Lebanon and Hezbollah. And it has covers. It covered! He didn't open it! He goes like this, wow, yeah. Many of them, wow, it's dangerous. I see, yeah, over there. <laughs> Such a clown! And the clown saved the life of thousands. He forced them to, to make it. All the experts were against it, and the one who has zero knowledge in military was for it. Why Hashem did it? to show you if you count on the generals, you're gonna go where they go in the next world. All this mechalelei Shabbat, ochlei trefot. Count on me. Here, someone who has no, uh, zero knowledge, <laughs> he bought you the salvation. Why? Because obviously it's not him. You see, it's me, no? Imagine without him, what would happen now? Every second a missile would fall in another building. They would shut the airport, they would shut everything. The country will be shut down. <laughs> the clown brought us the salvation. Baruch Adonai Leolam. Amen ve Amen. Rabbi Hanania ben Akasha Omer. Natsa Kadosh Baruch Hu Israel.